To understand how Jacob, one of the great leaders in Judaism, finds himself on the bank of a river wrestling with an angel, you have to go back a bit in the story. Now, for those of you who may believe that the Bible is boring, I promise this is straight up days of our lives. <laughs> in this story, Jacob has a twin brother, Esau. And from the time that they are in the womb, they are battling it out. In fact, part of the story tells us that while Esau is being born and he's the firstborn, as he comes out, they see that Jacob's hand is around his ankle trying to pull him back. <laughs> now, Jacob had always been his mother's favorite. Rebecca lavished praise and attention on her son Jacob, whereas Isaac, their father, favored Esau. Now, the firstborn, why Jacob might have been pulling Esau back, is because the firstborn had a whole lot of privileges. They had the birthright, and so they were to inherit their family's entire estate, which for Isaac was a pretty big deal. And so Rebecca, knowing this, helped her son Jacob to trick her husband Isaac into giving the birthright blessing to Jacob instead of Esau. See, Esau was a hairy dude, and Jacob wasn't. And so, I'm telling you, you can't, days of our lives. <laughs> and Isaac was very aged, and his vision was going, and so Rebecca took some lamb's wool and placed it across Jacob's arms and had him go to his father and ask for the blessing. So Isaac gives his blessing, and of course, in dramatic fashion, Esau comes in, realizes what has happened, begs his father to undo what has been done, and Isaac says, sorry, that's the magic of blessings. Tough luck, kid. That's when Esau turns to Jacob and says, I am going to kill you. And so Jacob flees for decades. He leaves his father's home. He builds his own wealth. Eventually, he returns Esau has gone on to his own land and his own family. But when Jacob returns, Isaac is cruel to him. I mean, just cruel. Have you ever seen a family where there's one parent that seems to just beat up on one of the kids? And so Jacob tries to take it for years, and finally he can't take it. He leaves. And who does he find waiting for him? Anybody? Esau. He's trapped between a rock and a hard place. And so like every great hero in the biblical story, he asks his wives to make a deal for him. <laughs> he sends his wives on with all of his possessions and says, go bargain with Esau and I'll wait here on the bank of this river and I'll come in morning after you, you know, do the soft pitch first. And there we find Jacob on the shore, waiting. And you thought you had family issues. <laughs> I love this story, not necessarily because I believe in angels or magical blessings, but because I think the story, when you dig just a little, has some really common truths. Jacob spends his entire life running, bargaining, and avoiding. So now at the shore, Finally readying to cross the river and face his fate with his brother, he encounters what I would say is an outward manifestation of a deep inward struggle. And this time, at last, after decades, Jacob doesn't run. Instead, we are told he wrestles with the angel, with God. I would say with himself. Now, if you've ever watched wrestling, the picture, which I think is by Rembrandt, in your order of service, it always makes it look like they're dancing. This is not wrestling, okay? If you've seen wrestling, it's hard to tell at points who is winning a wrestling match, right? Has anybody watched wrestling? Yeah? yeah. Anybody yeah. like WWF fans? Yeah. Okay, I thought I'd try. Just always interesting, you never know. 
So in wrestling, am I right, there's a lot of grabbing and, and rolling around, and it's intimate, right? I mean, you are in each other's business when you are wrestling, yes? Yes. Okay. So I want you to think about this. This story is telling us the man who has always fled is now in this intimate, in-your-business encounter with God. I would say, you don't have to be a theist to hear truth in this story. Jacob is finally getting down with himself and digging into the places and grappling with the truths that he has run from and tried to bargain away again and again. He's wrestling with his own light. Struggling to receive a blessing. We won't have that up for the whole time. <laughs> so what does blessing mean to a Unitarian Universalist? We who emphasize human agency and the natural world. So I could do the UU thing right now and tell you all the things it doesn't mean. Like <laughs> magical words that change your life. Or we could simply say this. That blessing is the wisdom that arises from relational presence in the world. Or as Reverend Kemmler, a minister in Massachusetts, says, blessing invokes wholeness. Blessing invokes wholeness. Now, I told this story that I'm about to tell you a couple, maybe it was last Sunday, at our third service. It's a, it's a personal story, and it's not an easy one to tell, because still after all these years, there's some shame and challenge in telling it. When I was first starting off in my very first congregation, I had been in a long-term relationship, and we had just gotten engaged. And so I told the entire congregation that I was getting married, and we were setting a date, and there was all sorts of excitement. And then about two weeks after telling the entire world this happy news, I found out that the relationship that I thought was the rest of my life was built on a lot of lies. And that my fiance had been having an affair for some time. And so I went through, if any of you have been through a difficult end of a relationship, particularly one where you feel betrayed in one way or another, I had to go through all of the shame and the sadness and really depression that comes with it. On top of that, I was starting in a new community in a very public role. And so I had to tell my congregation that this relationship that they thought they were getting ready for a big wedding had in fact ended. And so I told them that in the form of a letter, not with all the details, but just letting them know and asking for privacy. And someone took that letter and gave it to the local paper. Oh. So you can imagine the layers of, frankly, feeling victimized. And I went into this deep place of sadness. And I remember one of my good friends coming over to my house during that time, and she said, I would really like you to get to the anger phase. <laughs> <laughs> months and months into this, I called an old friend, and I started telling her about what was going on and how lost I felt and how lonely and how I was sure no one would ever love me again. And she said, wait, wait, hold on. What'd you just say? I said, I I'm sure no one will ever love me again. And she said, so you want to love someone else again? I said, yeah, that's kind of the crux of it. She said, well, that's remarkable. I mean, all things considered that you would even think about being in a relationship again and trusting someone. That's remarkable. And it felt in the moment like a punch in the hip. And it was a wake-up call. For me, it was the beginning of some serious wrestling. 
I stopped being the victim in my own story and the one whom all these things were happening to, and I started looking at my role in this relationship. And that simple, that's incredible from my friend, was a blessing that invited me into a place of wholeness with or without someone else. It was the start of a new me, a me who wasn't a victim, but also a me who wasn't perfect and had my own role in the end of that relationship. In the movie Arrival, the main character pictured here, Dr. Louise Banks, is brought into a close circle of scientists when aliens come to the Earth. This is going to relate. Don't worry. It's going to relate. It's not just the last movie I watched yet, last night. And I'm really sorry for this spoiler, but I can't tell this story without spoiling the plot of the film. So if you don't want to know what happens in the movie, just plug your ears and sing Blackbird to yourself right now. So at the beginning of the film, you watch a scene of Dr. Banks' daughter, Hannah, dying from an incurable illness. And all throughout the film, as Dr. Banks makes contacts with the, contact with the aliens, you see what you think are her memories of her daughter's life. And at the very end of the film, you realize that the aliens have been giving her glimpses into the life she has not yet led. And so none of this has happened yet. She is seeing it through dreams and visions, and they're giving her a foreshadowing of what her life will be, including introducing her to who will be the father of that child, Ian, with whom she's working in the field and the knowledge that Ian will leave her and that their marriage will end and she will care for her daughter alone in her final months. So Dr. Banks knows all of this. And the last frame of the film is her future husband, Ian, Hannah's father, asking her out on a date or, or in a way Something is, is coming, you know, in their relationship. And you wait to see what she's going to do with the full knowledge of what will unfold. And she walks toward that life. She walks toward Ian and toward giving birth to Hannah. I think about this film a lot. If you knew the beginning of the most awful thing in your life and that it was tied to the most wonderful thing in your life, would you stay in it? For what was beautiful and for who you would be for having lived that life. Our spiritual ancestors, the Unitarians, believed that we were blessed from birth, unlike their Contemporary Protestant cousins, the Unitarians did not believe in original sin. Instead, they believed it was a blessing to be human and having the ability to choose between good and wrong and deciding to stay in the struggle and being able to reason. They believed in our collective spiritual evolution. So the question for those of us among the living, which all of us in this room are, is how do we live in alignment with that original blessing? How do we wrestle with our light and invoke wholeness into our own life? In East Africa, there is a practice called Gersha, which is the practice of feeding one another with bread. You can kind of see it here in the photos, yeah? 
Now, this practice in East Africa, at least in my experience, violates just about every cultural norm in white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America. Yes? <laughs> Getting that close to someone's face and putting your fingers toward their lips and placing food in there. I just want you to imagine this with me. You don't know if they've washed their hands or, or what has happened in the last couple of hours, and they are going to feed you. Now, see, bread communion could have gone a whole lot more intimate, y'all. I'm just saying. Today, we could have we gone there. Maybe we'll ask the second service, huh? Yeah. But this practice has a really important truth to teach. Dr. Samuel Mahaffey says that the practice of Gersha defying Western conventions around sharing a meal speaks to a different way of engaging with the food we eat, engaging with each other around shared meals. It's an instructive way, he says, of being in relationship. It enhances the notion of relational presence as a way of bringing the sacred into ordinary life and ceremony as a rich exemplifier of relational being. Relational presence as a way of bringing the sacred, the ordinary, into life. Relational presence, it's not grabbing someone by the ankle and trying to beat them out in the birth process. It's that intimate wrestling. It's the place where it doesn't even matter what your name is, but you're there, wholly there. It's definitely about getting close, proximity to risk touch, and even the dirt of someone's hands. And it's a model for our own struggles. Over the next week and on across December, a whole lot of us are going to encounter some painful struggles. For some of us, it is the memory of what was good and is now gone. Others will battle loneliness. Or maybe you have an Esau or an Isaac in your life. Maybe you're Jacob right now, sitting on the shore. There are rivers we cross that present as the dining room table. There are rivers we cross as that present as the undialed phone numbers. Rivers as the chasm of grief. Relational presence. Sue Magidson, who is a Unitarian Universalist chaplain and affiliated minister with the U Church of Berkeley, writes that as a chaplain, she often doesn't do a whole lot with families who are in a time of trauma and grief. She doesn't have magical words that she says, and yet she reports that in almost every case, when she has completed her time with the family, they lavish her with hugs and, and words of gratitude, even though in some cases she's barely said a word. Now each day on her way to the hospital, Sue says this prayer. May I be what's needed. May I be of service. May I be a blessing. She says that simply being fully present, a relational presence, is what offers healing. I want to suggest that we not only hope for such a presence for others, that we could be a relational presence for someone else, but that we give relational presence to ourselves. One of the stories told in this time of year is that of the Wampanoag who met with some of those European settlers and helped them survive the winter. Now we know that the story does not end with bread being passed across a common table. Not all blessings are received. Some of us run for generations, leaving the carnage of brothers across the shores. What if a relational presence had been given? And what if it could still be given? 
What is breaking at our own tables that could cast curse or blessing generations from now? And what, beloved, in our being have we run from, have we tried to bargain our way out of, and what, before dawn breaks, might we wrestle into truth and into wholeness? In the words of the poet Elizabeth Alexander, I offer you this blessing in this season of flurry and common tables. As you sit on the shores and consider the rivers to be crossed, indeed, beloved, praise song for walking forward in that light.